Well, we, we have a very particularly exciting point in the kind of evolution of computational thinking and how to teach it right now. Uh, it's kind of a, I've been building a stack of technology now for, well, about 30 years uh, for this particular stack. And it's sort of reached a point where I think something exciting has happened, which is the set of things that sort of the fanciest R&D professionals get to use has converged with the set of things that kids that you teach can realistically learn. This is something that's happened in other areas, like video editing, for example, over the last uh, maybe 10 years. It's now happened with sophisticated algorithmic programming. And that's pretty interesting. Uh, I don't really know, you know, we've been doing experiments to try and learn what can we really do with these capabilities. Um, I think uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of those experiments. I think things are going really well. And uh, I think uh, the, what, what's possible now is, is pretty exciting. I mean, it, it, one thing to realize is that if you look at kind of the evolution of careers and things people do and so on, pick an area, call it X. Um, there either is now or will be in the future a computational X, whether X is archaeology or zoology or whatever else. Um, there's pretty much every area that people study in whether it's uh, in school or in a career is, is uh, uh, we're realizing can be enhanced by computation and that's sort of the future. And that's kind of one of the reasons I think it's pretty important to teach kind of general computational thinking. Now, it doesn't mean the same thing as programming. Programming is, a, is in many ways a kind of an engineering activity. And not everybody in the world needs to be an engineer. Not everybody in the world needs to be a programmer who can write a piece of C++ code or something like this. Um, but what is important is that everybody, uh, increasingly important is that everybody understand how to do computational thinking and can understand how to sort of formulate the things that they think about in terms of computation can go from an idea that they have to being able to actually implement that, make a computer do what they want um, as, as efficiently as possible. So we built, um, uh, the, the main thing I want to show you is Wolfram language. Um, Many of you will probably know Wolfram Alpha. Um, how many of you have students who use Wolfram Alpha? I bet that's incorrect. <laughs> because we know that pretty much every high school student in America uses it on average once a month. The average is maybe once every three weeks. So if, if you aggregate that over different students, um, there are probably some who don't use it at all, but others who use it every, every couple of days. Um, so, so Wolfram Alpha, as you, you may know, it's, it's a knowledge engine where you basically get to uh, oh come on okay. you get to ask it a question like you know let's ask it a fancy question you know what's the integral of you know x squared sine cubed x or something and it will go off and uh, think about it and sign um, it'll, it'll be the same the, for the things I'm showing you it'll be actually the same but. But um, there we go. So, so yeah, we ask it, work out that integral, gives us an answer. Uh, if we want to, we can have it, and this is a feature of the pro version, we can have it show us steps that a human could take to do that integral. Um, and uh, uh, that's um, a very popular thing. Um, we can also ask it other completely different kinds of things, like, um, um, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. What is the, um, uh, I don't know, what is the GDP of uh, Argentina? Um, and uh, it'll probably tell us that. And um, it'll give us some results and show us a plot of the function of time. Let's the GDP of Argentina divided by the US, things like this. We can ask it all kinds of questions. Uh, we could ask it, um, it, it's kind of interesting to, to sort of see how quantitative things get. I don't know, let's try it here. This might be interesting to hear. Let's say, you know, flights overhead. Hopefully, tell us probably a lot of these. Okay, so there's a bunch of planes there. Um, now we can go and look up one of those planes. Okay, there's a picture of uh, uh, the sky map as it might be. As you can see it, let's pick one of those planes. Um, and uh, we can probably see you know, what. Oh, that one for some reason doesn't have data. Who knows? Um, the, uh, um, it, uh, in many cases, you'll be able to get very detailed data on. Uh, Sort of everything to do with this. And what's interesting to do is just to see how much quantitative uh, stuff there is to compute with and think about um, in the world. Um, okay, there we go. So this is that particular plane, where it is now, uh, some information about it. It will probably show us there's a plot of the um, altitude as a function of time for the last, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever it is, 15 minutes or something. 
we can see this is the this is the ground speed of the plane and so on. It's kind of interesting stuff to talk about if you're sort of interested in kind of talking about quantitative um, types of things. Well, we could take a movie and we could look at you know how the box office uh, performance of a movie has gone as a function of time for all different kinds of movies. And in general, uh, what we've done with Malta over the last um, I don't know 15 years or so is uh, we've gone and sort of collected all of this uh, knowledge about the world and made it computable. It's the thing that powers, for example, the Siri intelligent assistant for Apple and S voice for Samsung and a bunch of other uh, other such things in the world. Um, it's something that uh, uh, for uh, for students it's often used for for doing you know math or music theory or chemistry or things like that. It's also used by by lots of professional people, uh, whether it's uh, doctors or policymakers or whatever else to to figure things out about. Uh, uh, about facts in the world, but the idea of Wolf Alpha is kind of a, a drive-by computation solution. You you type in a question in natural language, it will give you an answer. There's no manual to read. There's no uh, uh, sort of everybody can just walk up to it and, and start interacting with it. Um, the idea of Wolf language, which is the language in which Wolf Alpha is written, um, is it's it's evolved from this thing called Mathematica, uh, which first came out in 1988. Um, which is now uh, the 90% of universities in the US, for example, have site licenses for Mathematica at this point. It's extremely widely used in the kind of college education world. It's also very widely used in, in R&D, um, in companies across basically every industry. It's been responsible for all sorts of interesting inventions and discoveries over the last quarter century or so. Um, but uh, what's emerged from Mathematica is this language that we call Wolfram language, uh, on which Mathematica itself is now based. And Wolfram language is, is a combination of a very high-level programming language together with all the knowledge that's in Wolfram Alpha. And kind of the idea of Wolfram language is to build as much knowledge about computation and about the world as possible into the language and automate the language as much as possible. So sort of the idea is the humans get to have the idea about what they want to do, and then the language as much as possible automates the actual mechanics of getting the thing done. So let's, uh, let's start off just taking a look at what we can do with all the language. So can we pull you that to the back? If I can make it bigger. Zoom in a little bit. Bigger? Bigger. Bigger. Okay. Not a problem. That better? <coughs> yes? Yeah. OK. So let's, let's just start off. Um, you know, we can interact with the language. We can just say, you know, we can do a little computation. We can say, what's 1, 2, 3, 4 to the power 1, 2, 3, 4? OK, we get some answer. Um, we could say, you know, if we wanted to, we could say, you know, what's what's pi to I don't know, twenty thousand digits. There's the result. Um, now let's say we take, um, uh, but now we can start. Uh, we can do all kinds of things with this. Let's take the digits of pi. Uh, let's say we want the real digits of pi, um, and let's get um, ten thousand of those digits. Okay. Let's um, let's just get that list of digits. And now, for example, let's make a um, got the list of digits. Now, let's say we want to make a histogram of uh, uh, how frequent each of those digits is. So we just type histogram there, and we get some result. And that shows us that the, the digits occur roughly equally frequently um, in uh, each digit occurs roughly of equal, in e with equal frequency in pi. So, so as I say, the idea of this language is to be able to compute uh, anything kind of as automatically as possible. So we could, for example, let's say, let's, let's do something like this. Let's get an image to compute with. So my computer has to wake up. Let's see. Let's get an image here. There we go. There's an image. Um, and uh, so now I can take that image, and I could say, for example, let's do edge detection on that image. That's the result. Or I could say, let's say, dynamically uh, edge detect the current image. So it's pretty easy to read. Um, these uh, uh, the code here. It's just saying there's the current image. You edge detect it. You do that dynamically. There's the result. Okay, we can wave our arms around and do things here. Um, we can take uh, we can do all kinds of computation here. We could, for example, um, oh, let's take that image and we could say, for instance, let's say make it partition that image um, in uh, uh, little blocks of size 15 or something. Then we get that. And now we can do some slightly fancier code. We could say, let's let's sort each row of images there, and let's maybe assemble that um, into uh, uh, into um, into something like this. And maybe we could do that. Um, so, so I'm I'm sorting each row according to some criteria about its average color. I think you do the same thing. You just say, put make it that current image, 
and now we can get that weird effect um, going there. So now you know we can compute with all kinds of things. Like for example, I could pull in uh, well, let, let's I could pull in my Facebook friend graph, or I could just uh, make a random graph, which is a pretty good approximation of that. So here's a, a sort of random graph, and I could say, well, let me what are the clusters of friends that I have on that in that random graph? Um, and so I could do this, and I could, could go there, and that's the sort of cluster of friends that I have in that uh, uh, in that graph. Well, uh, I can, can compute with all kinds of things. Like let's say I want to get um, let's say let's get a list of words in English. Okay, so there's a list of words in English. There are about forty thousand of them. Let's say I want to get um, uh, let's let's just get the length of all of them. Length of all those words percent means the thing I just got, and let's make a histogram of um, uh, of the of those lengths. So there I've got that's a distribution of what the uh, uh, of the frequency of different word lengths in English. It's kind of interesting. Maybe we could do something different. Let's say we, we um, let's say we take the first letter of every word here. So let's do this. Um, this will work. Yeah. And now let's make, uh, for example, let's make a word cloud from that. Okay. So what's the most frequent first letter in English, actually? Okay. So the most frequent first letter looks like it's an S. Um, and let, let, let's say just for fun, let's let's do this um, uh, just to start using some other kinds of things. Let's say we do this um, instead of picking English as the language, let's pick, for example, Russian as the language. Um, we can do the same thing. And now we'll find out that's the most frequent uh, first letter in, in uh, for words in Russian. Um, so it's kind of fun to be able to, to pull in this sort of real world uh, type of, of, of knowledge here. Um, we can do. Uh, we can also make things. Let, let's let me show you something else that's, that's interesting. So so let's say I just want to make a um, I make a three plot some kind of mathy thing here. Let's make um, a um, a plot. Uh, what just happened to that? Pure and black, and that's a very bizarre thing. Okay. That's something new and different. Say for example, if I want to manipulate this, I can just say manipulate that. Let's say I add some parameter here. Um, then I could say manipulate that with the parameter a going from zero to five or something. Um, and now I've got the same thing, but I can now be waving it around um, as I change that parameter. It's really easy to make kind of interactive things in our language. I mean, I could equally well I could say something like you know manipulate um, something like blur, and let's pick one of those. Okay, um, let's let's pick I don't know let's let's pick something like like um, this image up here and now I could just say um, manipulate blur that image um, by some parameter r let's say r from zero to one hundred and now I get a control there and now as I move the control the image will blur that okay so it's pretty easy to write these kinds of things well uh, let, let's go on and. Um, uh, look at some other types of things. So we, we can. One of the things that's interesting here is being able to deal with sort of real-world data. So, for example, if I I can use natural language to specify real-world kinds of things. So, like for example, New York City. I can. There's the the thing that represents in our language New York City, and one property of that would be population. And so that will give us the population of New York City. Or we could say, for example, let's let's pick. Um, uh, let's do the following. Let's say. Um, I'll tell you what, let, let's, let's do something a little bit more. Let's take um, a person like Van Gogh. Okay? So let's say Van Gogh, and let's get some notable artworks of Van Gogh's. Okay, so there's a few notable artworks. Let's take, for example, the first, um, uh, let's say, take the first 10 notable artworks from here. And now, for example, we could say something like, um, uh, let's, let's do this. Let's get an image from each of those notable artworks. And then we've got those images. And let's say, for example, we want to take those images and we want to find out what are the um, uh, what are the dominant colors in <coughs> those images. Oops, I want to say um, let's let's just take. Oh, I tell you what. Let, let me do this. Let me say. Let me make a chromaticity plot 
which um, will give us, uh, uh, which will show us where, uh, where in color space the colors that are used in those images lie. That's kind of a, a kind of a, a, a fun thing to do there. Well, let, let's let's try something different. Let's say we want to get, um, a, let's say we want um, a list of planets. So let's say we have planets, um, and now we say we want a list of those. So we get a list of the entities that are planets. Let's say we want to get, uh, let's say we want to get images of those planets. Um, okay, we should be able to get those. Let's say, for example, we also want to get um, uh, uh, the masses of those planets. Percent alone just means the thing we got on line 11. Okay, so that will give us the masses of the planets. Now let's say we want to make a picture where we make an image collage using the masses of the planets and, uh, uh, and showing images of the actual planets. So that will now give us a picture that shows the, um, uh, the planets uh, drawn in a size that corresponds to their mass. So I think it's pretty neat that we can, in just some of the we can generate And what's even more interesting is kids can do this too. I mean, this is a, you know, I can do it fairly fast because I built this language. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, actually, the really scary thing is that there are now like 11 and 12 year olds who I think can do this stuff a little bit faster than I can. So that's, a, that's, that's interesting to me. Um, so lots of different kinds of things one can do, uh, lots of very fancy, uh, kinds of computation, uh, whether it's working with uh, 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 images or audio or things about geometry or um, uh, things about, um, oh, I don't know, we can pick another, let's pick another thing just for fun. Let's do, um, um, let's say, um, uh, we want to, just, just to give some sense of the kinds of data that are available here, let's say, um, I don't know, something like this, um, and let's say, uh, uh, let's try this. So this should, okay, there we go. So there's a, a mesh, the 3D mesh that corresponds to a femur bone. We have the data for basically all major anatomical structures. And you could start doing things like I could say, what's the area of the surface area of that femur bone? Or I could start doing all kinds of computations about stress analysis on this thing, whatever else I want to do. So uh, a very large number of different kinds of, kinds of things that one can compute with. Um, Lots of, uh, so oh, another, another important thing I should show you is um, this is not just something that you can do um, in, uh, uh, so big, big sort of thing is being able to deploy everything I'm doing to the web. I, I should explain something else, which is what I'm showing you here is the native version of Wolfram language running on a, on a, uh, a laptop. Um, there is also a version that runs just in the cloud. And if you just go to the Wolfram homepage, um, you will find that there is a version of, of what we call Programming Lab, um, which is kind of a version of the language um, that's been packaged for education. And there's an open cloud version of Programming Lab, which you can go to, and you just go in here, and without logging in or anything, you can um, go and uh, start doing more language programming. The way that we've set things up, there's sort of uh, two paths, well, three paths in. One, one path in is just to go there and start computing things. I could start doing my computation here. Um, I could start, uh, you know, I don't know, I could get that word list of English or something like this here. Um, and I could uh, start computing all kinds of things with it. Um, let's say I could take uh, well, whatever else, whatever I want to do here, I could do the, the kind of computation that I was doing before. I can now do this, this is just a web browser. Um, I can now do the exact kind of, uh, kind of thing here. And anybody can just walk up to, to a machine and start doing this stuff. If you want to save what you're doing, you have to log in. If you want to have more sessions and things, you have to pay five bucks a month or something, whatever it is, to start getting this. If you want to start managing this at a, at a sort of classroom level, there's a succession of different levels that allow you to do all kinds of things for, uh, for classrooms and schools and so on. Um, and you can do that. Everything you do is kind of can be done either in the cloud um, or on desktop versions. Um, the desktop obviously allows one to have somewhat more responsive uh, behavior when one's doing, for example, interactive manipulation of things, um, but the cloud allows one to do all of the computational stuff. Um, one of the things that, um, so uh, one important feature of the language in general is that it allows you very easily to deploy things to the cloud. So for example, let's say that I want to make a little app. Let's say I want to make an app that, um, let's say, let's. You know, we, we have data on all kinds of things. So let, let's make an app that takes a picture of an animal 
actually, before I do that, let me, let me show you another kind of data that we have. So, so this is telling me uh, what the position, uh, uh, what position it thinks my computer is in in the world. So let's say I want to make a disk that is, uh, let's say, a one mile radius around that particular position. So I can go ahead, we have data on all these maps. So that should be where I am right now. If I wanted to, I could do this. Let's just make a, a kind of a powers of 10 thing where I say it's in quantity here, 10 to the power n miles, for example. Um, and let's say I go table of this um, and uh, let's say n zero to how big is the earth? Four, let's say. Okay, so what this should do is make a series of pictures um, that start from right here uh, and then go out in sort of powers of 10 size until eventually we're covering pretty much the whole Earth except for a spot in the, uh, um, down by Australia there. So that's, so that's because of the projection. It looks kind of weird because of the projection we use. We probably use a different, let's see, I could say, um, uh, let's use a different geo projection. Um, I don't know these, um, maybe a Robinson projection, see what that does. So this will, this will now be projecting the Earth in a different way. Um, see how that, how that works out. Um, and uh, okay, okay. So it's a little bit more obvious. Well, no, it's not so much more obvious what's going on here, but maybe a little bit more obvious what's going on there. So anyway, the, the um, so that's. But let, let's let's go ahead and start building something for the for the um, for the web. So let's say we're going to make a form, and um, we're going to say um, uh, we want to make a picture, um, and this is going to make something which is a form which expects to get one thing: the name of an animal. <coughs> Um, and uh, we're going to say cloud deploy that. And now what this will do is it will create for us a, 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 a set of the URL on the web. When we go to that URL, actually, you know what, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to say uh, make that, make the thing that I did, make it public. So I want to deploy it so that anybody in the world can see the thing that I just made. So I say permissions goes to public, um, and now it will create uh, this object here, and I don't have to log in or anything, I'll just go there and we'll ask for the name of an animal, and I say tiger, for example, and it should come back with a picture of a tiger. Um, so I can go back, I can change this code, um, I could say, for instance, let's say I want to um, uh, magnify that picture by a factor of um, uh, three or something, let's say I want to rotate it by a certain angle, um, let's say I rotate that by an angle, um, and let's say it's an angle of degrees, um, okay, so now I'm going to make another app here, um, and I say a lion, and I say uh, 50 degrees or something here. Yeah. Now I should get a picture. So now I'm going to make another app here. Uh, I want it to show me the thing as, a, as an image on the web. Um, so this is where this is where we have to you have to go out of the language and start dealing with kind of the, the world of the web. I don't know what we could say. Let's say an otter at 60 degrees. Um, and uh, okay. <laughs> Um, yes. Sir, how how did you choose that picture? So this is, I mean, so that we have a large amount of curated data, and we have sort of typical pictures of things in the world. So for for about uh, maybe half a million kinds of species, we have a picture of that species. Um, we can do things. So here's another type of thing we can do. Um, we can uh, actually we can do the inverse of this. We can say. If you have a thing, we can use all sorts of fancy machine learning to say, what is that thing? So if I say, let, let's take, um, so I say image identify, um, let's take a picture from the web. Uh, here, let me just pull up my web browser. Let me just, oh, actually, you know what? I can do that right within that system. I could just say, um, uh, just say um, web image search, uh, and let's try otter and web image search and see if this works. Uh, maybe it will work, maybe it won't. This is actually not a feature that is available to the typical user, so it might not work for me here. Um, no, okay, well let, let's just, uh, uh, oh, yes, it worked, okay. Um, so, uh, let me just do this. Um, there we go, okay, so let, let's say, um, so what I just did there was I got from the web a bunch of pictures of otters, or things that claim to be otters. And now I can say image identify um, each of those. And so what should happen now is that we'll actually run 
uh, our image identification machine learning system across those pictures, and some of them are thanks to sea otters, some of them are Eurasian otters. They're all otters, apparently, which is a, a good sign. Um, the, uh, uh, but, but you know, we can do, actually, if we wanted to, we could say dynamic image identify of, um, uh, actually, what would we do to do this? Um, let's say column where we have, um, uh, let's say, we say, how would we want to do this thing, and the image identify of the thing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just writing a piece of code that should um, take the current image and uh, dynamically show us, there we go, okay, it's person, that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> see what that. Fly away, okay. Let's try, um, okay, it gets a little bit confused, there was that remote control. <laughs> It's kind of fun to play with. But, but this is using very fancy modern machine learning techniques um, that happens to be available as, a, as, a, as just a function in our language. So anyway, um, this is some of uh, what you can do with local language. Um, I think, uh, let me maybe show, uh, um, if, I, if I go back to our cloud, um, uh, here we go. So programming lab is kind of the way into this for typical uh, students. We've kind of got uh, three approaches. One is you can just go without any uh, safety net and just start using Wolf language, just like the fanciest professionals do. Uh, sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum is uh, what we call explorations. Um, an exploration is something where uh, we've given you There we go. Okay, so this is a typical exploration where we're starting off from code that will run. You can just take this piece of code and run it if you want to. But kind of the idea is that you get to hopefully read some of the text um, and make modifications to that code to change it so that you get a feeling for what the code does. And you go through this exploration and gradually it will build up um, different kinds of things um, uh, that, that you can do. This is the open cloud version that you can do more if you sign in and so on. So, so one step is, is to uh, um, go through and um, uh, do these explorations where you start from code that works and, and you are modifying it to get it to do interesting things and then you get to sort of uh, do challenges where you go off the stuff that's already been built and start um, doing other kinds of things. Um, the other approach decided last summer finally that we needed to have sort of a systematic way through an introduction to our language and I kind of been hoping other people would do this, but eventually I decided, okay, I have to define at least some path through, you know, how do you learn computational thinking, how do you learn our language. Um, so I ended up writing this book called Elementary Introduction to Open Language, um, which is a kind of a zero math, zero programming uh, assumed book um, that gets you to, in fact, pretty advanced programming. I mean, I, I wrote this book primarily for kids. But it turns out it's getting used in all kinds of professional situations and graduate schools and all kinds of things like that as well, which is kind of almost, almost uh, um, uh, kind, kind of funny. But, but um, um, in any case, the, the, the book, you can find the book free online. Um, and uh, there's some, in fact, one of the things that is new as of this week is that you can, if you go to the book, um, here's the book, you know, you can go to a section about colors and styles or something. And you can actually, um, uh, there are exercises for each of these sections, and we now have automatic grading of these exercises, which is an interesting problem because um, uh, the, um, uh, what we're doing here is, um, okay, so let's see, um, make a red, green, blue column, okay, so let's say I say, I, have these, uh, I think I know how to do this, so let's say red, yellow, green, um, and now it will say, and I say, okay, I can check whether it works here. Okay, great, that looks like a traffic light. Check my solution. Okay, correct. Um, if I change that to, um, you know, purple or something, it will uh, it will say that that's not correct. Um, this is an interesting, um, uh, uh, you know, it's an interesting problem because it's sort of a mixture of grading an essay and grading math because there's not just one right answer. You could write this code in a whole variety of different ways, and so. It's an interesting challenge to do that. I think I ran out of time, but, but I really, what I really wanted to 
thing that's most interesting to me is to find out what you want to know about. So maybe we can just take just a, a few minutes before our lunch gets. Um, we can do it. Maybe maybe just just one or two quick questions. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, so why on earth are we uh, in schools still messing around with things like a TI-84? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's, um, the fact is, you know, it's a funny thing. There was a, I was just looking at, um, uh, for various reasons that if you read my blog, you'll find out what they are next week. I was just looking from uh, 1900 what the Cambridge Mathematical Tripos exams consisted of. Yeah. And they were teaching, they were asking questions, which many of which assumed people didn't have ready access to books. So they had to memorize a bunch of things because they weren't going to have a copy of the book. Well, obviously that's kind of gone away in, in subsequent years. Now we're still doing things where we sort of assume you won't have access to a computer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of goofy. Um, the, you know, the fact is what's happened right now you know, is primarily a testing related thing that, you know, exactly what can you uh, you know, what should you assume the student have a has access to so they can't just answer the question by asking the computer? Now, the fact is, I think if the question is answerable by the computer, it may be the wrong question to ask the human. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a, um, the other thing to say is that, that it will be, um, it, it's, you know, this is, this is more of a policy type of question about, uh, you know, how, you know, standardized testing is done than it's a question about technology or what makes sense to teach. And that's a, something we happen to be a little bit involved in, but that's a, a different topic. Um, Can we give everyone, uh, Stephen, a huge round of applause and thank you for coming?